today we have with us the Deputy Foreign Minister of Iran, Syed Mohammad Qasim Sajjadpur. Thank you very much, sir, for being on the show. And I think let's just dive straight into uh, the interview because Iran is always in the news. And I think there's a very old um, and deep interest amongst Indian news consumers for what's going on in Iran. But I want to start by asking you whether you think today India and Iran ties are being held hostage by the United States? No, but uh, I think you can see that there are circles in the United States which would like to take this relationship hostage to their own desires. But I think uh, India and Iran, first of all, have a long history of interactions and connectivity, uh, closeness uh, that makes it, I mean, the relationship immune of uh, this type of wishes. Mm. Uh, second, I think you have to consider that both of us, I mean, Iran and India are independent states. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, you have a good relationship with the United States, but I think I consider as myself as a student of uh, international politics, uh, Indian independence, a very important feature of its foreign policy. Mm -hmm. uh, however, they try also to impose sanctions on different nations, yeah. which I think uh, uh, is uh, illegal, uh, ir irrational in a way, and uh, I think would be rejected. So to, totally, I would say there is the challenge of U.S. for U.S. Uh, for Indian-Iranian relationship, but by no means uh, it can be hostage. Following America's withdrawal, the United States began reimposing nuclear-related sanctions on Iran. All U.S. nuclear-related sanctions will be in full force by early November. They will be in full force. After that, the United States will pursue additional sanctions, tougher than ever before, to counter the entire range of Iran's malign conduct. All right. Um, but taking on the point of the sanctions, I mean, these are bilateral sanctions, the unilateral sanctions the United States has imposed on Iran. India currently has uh, the benefit of a waiver as far as importing oil is concerned. But the fact that it's become difficult once again to do business uh, with Iran um, is is an impediment. And I mean, we have we have a situation where there is this waiver that lasts for six months. March is not so far away. What happens after that? Are the Iranians worried? And, uh, first of all, we are not worried because uh, Iran is a self-confident actor. Mm -hmm. We have it's not new for us sanctions. Uh, it's 40 years of different types of sanctions. Mm -hmm. This one is unilateral. It's very unjust. And I also question what has Iran done that should be sanctioned. Hmm. Iran negotiated within a time span of uh, two years and a half with uh, five plus one, which included the United States. It was uh, under an international umbrella of negotiations. And finally, we came to JCPOA. And it was uh, verified and sanctioned by a United Nations Resolution 3229 and 20, which means this is not uh, just an easy document. Mm -hmm. It is a document uh, approved by uh, United Nations. And Iran, based on not just one report or two reports, more than a dozen of reports of international uh, agency for atomic uh, energy has been abiding to these the words the spirit whatever you want to call it of this uh, agreement hmm. now suddenly a person has come in the United States and is telling that since it has been negotiated by another president I want to put sanction on Iran to come to a new agreement. Mm -hmm. I think there is no logic it. There is nothing that Iran has done. So it is a very illogical 
immoral uh, sanction imposed on Iran, and I think we can uh, manage it. Actually, we have managed much more difficult times in, in sanctions, uh, and I think it's not going to be uh, as difficult as it was in, in, in the past. So be confident that uh, we will find ways to overcome these challenges. So when you say that the sanctions are illegal, they have been imposed unilaterally, uh, simply because you know one president doesn't like the work of his predecessor, um, even before the United States actually formally withdrew from the JCPOA, its other partners in the agreement, the, the European Union, European countries, uh, were also showing some signs of concern at what America may or may not do. And yet today we're in a situation where the EU is also thinking of imposing sanctions for other reasons uh, on Iran. I think you, you have not to mix the, these issues together. Mm -hmm. First of all, any sanction should have a reason or rationale. There is no reason, no rational for it, just the fluctuation and impulse of one personality is the beginning. I think what you refer to as uh, India showing concern, in India didn't show any concern on what Iran has done. Mm -hmm. And I think even Indian state, Indian government didn't show any concern. There were companies who, which have financial ties with U.S. banks, they were concerned. So you have to differentiate between different types of uh, concern. And EU, I think there was something uh, very different, uh, uh, actually uh, uh, totally different, unrelated, and uh, uh, even that one also was baseless. Mm -hmm. However, I think uh, that is even not comparable with the sanctions that United States uh, is, is trying to, uh, to impose. Uh, furthermore, on Europe, on India, I have to say one very important point, which seems very conceptual, but I think it is very real. Mm -hmm. You know, the sanctions on Iran by the US is not just sanction on Iran per se. It is a sanction on EU also. Mm -hmm. And I have to say it's a sanction on India also. Mm -hmm. How? Because if today the President of the United States comes and says, I don't abide by an agreement that my government has signed, and I impose sanction on this country, which I just pinpoint, tomorrow there would be no international law, and American domestic law would become an international law and if India wouldn't abide to it or Europe wouldn't abide to it, then it would be sanctioned. So it is about not Iran or uh, uh, sanctions, it's about how international law, law is, how a, an executive order of American, an American president can become international law, mm -hmm. which you see this is change of the structure of international law, and I think it is not to the benefit of everybody. This is why EU, EU has been persistent. They are friends of the United States, you know. Mm -hmm. they, they are allies. They have resisted any attempt of, Ameri any, of the U.S. president on accepting these uh, sanctions. Mm -hmm. They may not be in agreement with the Iran, on many, let's say, issues or some issues. But they have said JCPOA is an international agreement. It is about European even values because international law, organizations, diplomacy matter. Furthermore, they are saying that it's about European security because if we solve a conflict by negotiation, yeah. and that conflict is not an easy one, I mean, that. Don't forget that the Iranian nuclear fight for almost 12 years was a matter of international okay. negotiation and so on. So we solved it by negotiation. Now if, if there is any bridge in it, then it would impact not just the norm. So you're essentially saying that, I mean, there is no respect for 
a global rules based order anymore yeah. in this current scenario in fact uh, your foreign minister javed zarif uh, who's also been in delhi has spoken uh, quite quite a lot about a post western world and a post western order what does iran exactly mean by that because in a post western world um who leads it uh, first of all uh uh, what he says it relates to the fundamental changes which has happened during the last two, three decades mm -hmm. in the nature of power. Mm -hmm. Power by itself has been evolved and changed right. by power holders, centers of powers, pullers of powers. So this is not the world that we were accustomed to. Mm -hmm. Then you setting in which you, we are there is a shift of power from Europe from the West to the East now China is important now India is important now what, when he, what he means by post-war now West is not in a position mm. to impose its will as it was before now the West doesn't have all the instruments available to it as it was available to, to it before. And yet the West is trying to, the West he and said the so. United States is trying to impose its will. I mean, the sanctions are Yeah, but are there is also position. resistance. There is resistance. Now you see, uh, it's not, all international politics is not about the US. Right. All international politics is not about the West. Right. Non-West matters. So this is why we call it post-West right. era. Okay. Um, Again, and just staying with this a little more, because India sees itself as a global leader in what you might call a post-West era. And yet, in the neighborhood, in countries like Iran, uh, and in the larger sort of region, um, there, is a, there is a tussle for power. I mean, there is a tussle for uh, being seen as the most important country vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. And, you know, so we're seeing that sort of play out all across in terms of investments, in terms of the Belt and Road Initiative, Iran has had different views on it. Um, on the question of the Chabahar port, uh, while the work has finally begun and you know, uh, I don't know if in Farsi what the saying is, but in Urdu it's De Rai Durustai. Um, but I want to ask you, in 2016 when Prime Minister Modi was in Iran and we met some dignitaries they said that Chabahar was not going to be exclusive to India in the long run. That was something that was of tremendous concern to India. Um, does that position still hold? What happens? Uh, actually, I think what's important about Chabahar, first of all, uh, it's a mega project. Mm -hmm. I think it is a significant um, connectivity project and it is very fundamental for the development of uh, that part of the world, including Afghanistan and also the eastern part of Iran. So we look at it as a, an important project. But what you uh, are uh, talking about, I think we are not going to get uh, in the comp different regional and global competition over this uh, project. Mm -hmm. We say Chobar is not against any other project. It is not uh, defined against you know any other so this Gwadar. is um, Gwadar actually we have said it, it can be complementary to, uh, to those is that still Iran's position that yeah, Chabahar and I mean, are complementary uh, to each other it is our position that for the development of the region all this contribute and it's not exclusively mutually exclusive of each other so you need to really invest a lot in that part of the world because of economic development, because the life of people, mm -hmm. as well as uh, security. When you invest, there would be more economic advancement and more secure place and everybody will enjoy. So that brings me to sort of a two-pronged question. One is on the nature of security that you're saying, you know, uh, in terms of not just the complementarity of projects in the larger regional security uh, paradigm, but 
does that sort of really take into account the realities? I mean, there are tensions. India and Pakistan don't see eye to eye. Uh, India and China are rivals for economic heft and power uh, in the region. So when you say things like everyone should work together and these are all complementary projects, I mean, does that really take into account reality? Yes, I have uh, a question from you for answering your question. <laughs> You have I get good, to ask the question. No, no. <laughs> you have a good relationship with China. You have, I think, around to $60 billion of trade with China. So, when you have, you talk about uh, competition, challenges, a strategy calculation, it is not negating the, let's say, every details mm -hmm. that exist on the scene. So, what I am saying, yes, there may be competition, rivalry, but all the realities cannot be alluded just to one single factor analysis of mm -hmm. rivalry and competition. I think the picture is not white and black. There are different components. There are cooperations between different uh, nations in this. It's not just all negativity and you have positive elements in the whole picture which you have also reckoned upon. And uh, as far as the India-Pakistan reality is concerned? India, the, I think, uh, you know, it's a very uh, tough issue to discuss in one minute. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, the Iranian suggestion for peace pipeline uh, is uh, still there. And I think uh, if you look at the, this project, it is, uh, uh, yes, it's about money, it's about technology, it's about economy, but it's also having... Uh, peace, uh, dividend on the security of the region, the issue of connecting these regions together through energy. So, also on the issue of security, I mean, a more pressing concern perhaps is Afghanistan. And yet, uh, and on Afghanistan, once again, we come back in a sense to the United States because they've announced this uh, withdrawal of troops. And it seems that Washington, this president, uh, Donald Trump, is very clear that by the end of this year, there will be no U.S. troops left in Afghanistan. Um, this poses a question about the stability of the region, uh, the security of the region, what happens with the Taliban uh, once uh, this troop withdrawal is complete. What are Iran's concerns on this front? Uh, Afghanistan is our neighbor. Mm -hmm. uh, we really think that uh, security, stability and economic development are linked together in Afghanistan. So, and it, it, it is not exclusively to Afghanistan borders, if it's instability there, it would have ripple effect on, on the region. So Afghanistan is very important for Iran. I think it's very important for all the regional actors. But uh, what's happening there? First of all, uh, I think uh, if you remember, the United States invaded Afghanistan in 2001 on one pretext, mm -hmm. that Taliban is sheltering Al-Qaeda, yeah. and now it's very, I mean, as a student of international relations for me, it's a very international case study. Now it is Taliban, which is bringing United States to negotiating table as they started. Mm. So this is why it happened. Mm. Why? 17 years or 18 years of uh, mili to high military involvement, no result. I think the reason was bad decisions, uh, mistakes from the beginning, mm -hmm. and searching for easy solutions for difficult problems. Mm -hmm. And also using foreign policy as a tool for domestic politics. I think at that time, United States wanted to show that oh, it is not uh, indifferent mm -hmm. to September 11th terrorist actions, so they found this uh, target and, and, and they did. So I think U.S., regardless of its uh, military might, is not, has not acted in a matured fashion hmm. on this issue. Now on uh, uh, the current situation, yeah. Trump has said that his desire is uh, to leave Afghanistan. Are you sure that you, U.S. will leave Afghanistan? Can you be sure that his position is not going to change 
by the end of next week. Well, he's been consistent on this since he came to power. But you see, he's not alone. There is tension between him and the establishment. He wants out, out of, to be out of Afghanistan, but the establishment wants uh, to be in. And they want to be in for very strategic reasons, checking uh, and containing China, mm -hmm. containing Russia, containing Iran, having eyes even on Pakistan, and possibly even you know, on, on, on India. That may be true, but there's a, there is not public support in the United States for a continued true presence. And that's what, as a political person, that's what he's, he's banking on. That, you know, he has public support for his this announcements, is, even yeah. if not from the establishment. But you see, uh, the public, it's not that whatever public wants, it's ma materialized. Mm -hmm. Because there's a process to transform the public will to a real... So let me flip this around. Do you think that there is a role for the Taliban in any negotiations uh, in Afghanistan under the current circumstances today? I think uh, as a reality, they are a, a, a part of reality. Mm -hmm. You know, they... And you cannot ignore reality. But does it mean whatever they they are for is right whatever they have done is right i think these are not so there is a reality identification and there is also a normative base on normative base i think you can really challenge what they have done in the past uh, and their ideology and so on and so forth so does iran see them as a as a real threat if they come in in any kind of power sharing arrangement in afghanistan it is difficult to judge it depends on how they come on what agenda and what type of uh, let's say format as well as more importantly what type of behavior right so we're running out of time so let me quickly wrap up on this interview um with, this is the beginning of the year, so we have a whole 12 months of 2019 to look ahead to. Uh, we've seen a lot of turbulence, largely caused by America's decision to withdraw from the JCPOA in the last year. Um, going forward, uh, for Iran domestically uh, and specifically vis-a-vis -vis the India-Iran relationship, what are your hopes? Um, what would you like to see specific movement on uh, and on the domestic front the reason I asked this is because you know after the agreement there was a sense of hope in Tehran I was in Tehran in 2016 and there was foreign investment coming in and you know businesses were starting up and suddenly it's sort of gone back to the same as far as the economy is concerned so there is there is a sense amongst the Iranian public as well that something has to give right Yes, but uh, I think Iranian public is matured enough not to think that everything is uh, through JCPOA. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have a concept in Iran called resi resilient economy or resistant economy, which uh, actually is not to put all our economic uh, uh, eggs in the basket of foreign frames. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, uh, Iranians are learning how to cope uh, with the situation and I think uh, we have uh, we are going to have of course challenges but what I believe in my country it's in capability to manage the challenges and it's not new as a, we are not a new nation and these issues are not new so I'm remain hopeful that we manage it well actually I think we have even passed the most difficult times of new sanctions and now the, the peak of these sanctions has uh, passed and we have been able to manage. On the Iranian-Indian relationship, mm -hmm. I think first of all the base is solid. It is a solid relationship. It is based of course on civilizational, cultural uh, ties, but also on very economic uh, interests. And I think there is mutual interest here involved. And I hope uh, this uh, relationship uh, be more immune and independent of third variables mm. or third uh, parties uh, and I think uh, this is what a healthy relationship between Iran and India should be. A, a very uh, solid relationship which you can have predictability, 
uh, and the possibility of interaction in a more uh, calculated way. And with the United States, do you think there's something Iran can do to kind of come back to the negotiating table to try and perhaps rebuild some of what has been lost in the last year? We have not done anything wrong. It is the United States which has to rebuild, uh, you know, a process that it, it ruined. But can Iran be the bigger country in this regard and ho hold out a hand and say, shall we get back to the table? It is, is that a, a possibility? It is a hypothetical question, very difficult to answer. All right, Mr. Sajadpur, thank you so much for thank giving you. us some of your thank time. You. Thanks a lot. To receive instant updates on all videos from The Wire, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon. Pay to support independent journalism. Click the link in the description and choose the amount you want to pay.